Colleagues, it's a, a great pleasure to welcome you all here um, to the first Centre for Science and Policy uh, lecture of the year. Um, we welcome you on behalf of Centre for Science and Policy and also the wider Cambridge Public Policy Initiative. It's a particularly important time for us as we welcome the first uh, cohort of master's students into the new MPP. Um, but I don't want to take up any time talking about us. I will, however, uh, point out that this um, lecture is being filmed and uh, streamed live, so you might want to bear that in mind. Um, please, that does mean uh, if you could turn your mobile phones to silent, that would be great. And when you ask a question, please do wait until you have um, a microphone in order, to, in order to ask the question. We very much um, welcome tw Twitter, tweets and Twitter, and here the uh, uh, use, username, password, and, and you can tweet using the hashtag Hashtag Woolpert, and that probably rather gives uh, gives the game away, because um, but but I will now hand over to uh, Dame Fiona Reynolds, who's going to chair uh, tonight's lecture. Fiona is a relatively new master of Emmanuel College, comes to Cambridge, having been director general of the National Trust, and we're very grateful to Fiona for chairing this evening's lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Rob, and thank you for that warm introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'm brand new in Cambridge, so this is a, a pleasure for me. Um, it's my job to uh, welcome you all and to introduce our speaker tonight, Sir Mark Woolport, who may need no introduction, but just for the record. Um, Sir Mark is the Chief Scientific of Advisor to Her Majesty's Government and Head of the Government Office for Science. He came to that role from the Wellcome Trust, where he was director for 10 years. And before his role at the Wellcome Trust, he was professor of medicine and head of the division of medicine at Imperial College London. He received a knighthood in the 2009 New Year's Honours List for services to medical research and was elected a fellow of the Royal Society in 2011. And so Mark, we're very delighted to have you here tonight to talk to us about energy and climate change challenges for science and policy. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Um, thank you very much indeed. I'm absolutely delighted to be here, and I'm delighted that there's such a big turnout because one of the most important things about this topic is engagement with the public, indeed with publics. It's very important that we have the opportunity to talk about this. And my talk is really in three parts. Um, firstly, on the science, and the science of climate is a very difficult science, the second part of my talk is on communications. And in many ways, the communications is at least as difficult as the science to do well. And then the third part of my talk is on what is the hardest of all, which is on the policy choices that face each of us, both individually, as communities, as nations, and as the planet, the combined nations of the planet as a whole. So those are the three parts of the talk. So the scientific challenge is a complex one. It is actually observing, it's about understanding, it's about trying to predict the behavior of an immensely complicated system. <laughs> and one of the big challenges is the distinction between whether and climate. And of course, climate is essentially the, the average of weather measured over different time scales. So this is a picture of the weather systems of the planet. Um, and there are a number of important natural influences on the climate. And each of these operates on different time scales. And of course, the one that we are all entirely familiar with from our earliest age are the seasonal cycles. But then imposed on these are the cycles that take a number of years. So the El Nino and La Nina systems, which recur every few years. And then there are the multi-decadal cycles, which happens over 10s, 20s, 30 years. So ocean current changes, so the Pacific decadal oscillation and that causes shifts in the climate every 20 to 30 years. Because, of course, the oceans are an enormous, gigantic, 
but not unlimited heat source. And then there are the multi-century cycles. So there are changes in so solar cycles. These range from the 11-year cycle between the sunspot minima and the maxima to the so-called Milankovitch cycles, which relate to the Earth's orbital parameters. And those are seen most obviously in the 100,000-year ice age cycles. And starting to look at the relationship between uh, the temperature of the planet as a whole and uh, some of these cycles. Um, and I'm grateful to Eric Wolf, who's sitting in the second row for this slide, um, and the challenges of collecting these extraordinary cores uh, from the Antarctic. Um, but what the graph here shows is some of those very long uh, time cycles, and the abscissa here is um, 800,000 years before the present. This doesn't come, as you'll see, right to the present. Um, but you can see on the bottom uh, the carbon dioxide concentration uh, cycling very closely um, with the measured um, derived temperature measure from the ice cores. So a correlation over a very long period. But what has changed? And what has changed is that since the Industrial Revolution, the carbon dioxide levels measured in the atmosphere are now higher than at any time than they've ever been measured in the last 800,000 years and are just touching the 400 parts per million. And that's happened over an extraordinarily short time scale. And you can see this is entirely out with anything that's happened uh, before. Now, the observations of climate change are not simply based on a single or even multiple set of measures of a single parameter. In other words, the temperature um, of the atmosphere near the surface of the Earth. Um, and this is from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report released just about three weeks ago. Um, and of course, the reason for the timing of this lecture now is that the fifth IPCC report on the physical basis of climate change has just been released and is the most astounding piece of scientific meta-analysis. So I'm used to meta-analyses in medicines and the Cochrane Review, uh, and it's a very powerful technique. But I don't think anything has ever been done in science quite on the scale of the IPCC meta-analysis. 259 lead authors from 39 countries, reviewing literally thousands of papers, and each of those papers published in the scientific literature with multiple referees. This is an extremely rigorous piece of work. And so um, this is all fairly basic physics. What one would expect to see as temperatures rise is um, reductions in glacier volume, a rise in temperature over land, a reduction in snow cover. Um, rise in the air temperature in other levels of the atmosphere, um, with water evaporating and increase in water vapor in the atmosphere, um, reduction in the area of sea ice, um, changes in sea surface temperature and ocean heat content, and because of expansion of the water and uh, release of snow from uh, glaciers and other sources, um, a rise in the sea level. And these are all being seen. And so this, which is a very um, complicated graph and I think quite difficult to see in the lighting conditions in this lecture theatre, um, but shows all of the trends. So um, at the top, you see the land surface area temperature from four different data sets, uh, the tropospheric temperature from seven data sets. Um, someone's signaling to reduce the light. I think if you can reduce the light a bit. Um, the sea surface temperature here, rising. Uh, the marine air temperature a couple of data sets, sea level rising very consistently, the extent of summer Arctic sea ice extent. So all of those expected consequences of warming of the planet are being seen. So the measures of climate change are not based on a single data set. They're based on a whole set of essentially uh, interrelated data sets. And, of course, the challenge is untangling the different components of 
climate. So the annual cycles, the decadal cycles, the longer cycles. Um, and this is um, how this has been achieved. Work, again, reported by the I, uh, uh, IPCC, um, where here are the collective measurements of temperature change. And then the various anomalies have been identified, so the various other factors that change. Um, and we can see in the second panel down the solar component, the contribution. Um, and you'll note, of course, that whilst the, uh, the, the scales are different here, so uh, the ordinate here is from uh, 0.1 degree there, uh, the ordinate on the total temperature change is, is 0 0.8 degrees centigrade. Um, you can see that the volcanic component goes in the opposite direction. So volcanoes um, emit ash into the atmosphere, and that has a general cooling effect. Um, you can see the internal variability, and this is mainly due to ocean currents cycles. Um, and then at the bottom, you can see distilled from all of this the anthropogenic component to climate change. Now, one of the problems here, I think, is nomenclature. And I'll come to the sort of numbers issue in the middle part of my talk when I talk about communication. Um, and the term warming probably doesn't really capture what's going on. What we're actually seeing is climate disruption. And of course, the warming is not an even phenomenon over the whole of the planet's surface. It varies in different parts. Uh, in some parts, it's much more, and in others, it's rather less. Um, but what we're, what we're seeing evidence of, and again, you can't precisely attribute a single weather event to climate change. But when you take the collective, and this is being studied and becoming more and more obvious, then there is evidence of significant human anthropogenic contribution to some of the more extreme events that we've seen over the planet over the last few years. So the heat wave in the USA in spring of 2012, the Iberian drought in the winter of 2011, and the Arctic sea ice minimum, and of course the Arctic sea ice has been going progressively down in the, in the summer. Uh, the extraordinary rainfall in Australia in the summer of 2012 and in New Zealand in the winter 2011, and the inundation associated with Storm Sandy in the autumn of 2012. So it's, I would say easy, but it's, we can be pretty sure about measurements from the past, especially the physical measurements which are measured directly. Um, there are always uncertainties about predicting the future. Um, but there's very good evidence, and the modeling shows the trends and the likely consequences of an increased rise in climate. And so these two figures, uh, this one and the next one, show the consequences in relation to different uh, systems on which we depend as temperature uh, rises above the pre-industrial. And this is the two degrees centigrade at which it's generally agreed uh, if we that we should aim to keep um, temperatures rising below that level if we possibly can. But of course, there is no uh, single magic point. And what we see is increasingly adverse consequences as the climate change uh, becomes greater and greater. Um, and so in terms of water, um, we see uh, initially we see increased water availability in the mid-tropics and in the high latitudes. So we see areas where there's an excess of rainfall and the consequences of storms. Um, and in other parts of the world, we see decreasing water availability. We see drought um, in the mid-latitudes and in the semi-arid low attitudes. And all of this and these are projections um, are, 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 of an increasing proportion of the population who have increased water stress, either from too little or too much in the wrong place. Um, in terms of our ecosystems, and of course there are many things that affect ecosystems as well as um, climate, um, but in most cases I think it has to be said that humans are not uh, positive contributors to the diversity of ecosystems. Uh, we're seeing already amphibian extinction, um, and we see increased risk of extinction of species as the temperature rises. Uh, we see problems due to uh, the temperature rising in the seas and the acidification, which is associated with the uptake 
of carbon dioxide. So we see the bleaching of corals, and we see eventually widespread coral mortality. Um, and there are obviously consequences in terms of species ranges, uh, their migrations, uh, the risk of wildfires. Um, in terms of food, um, in terms of crop productivity, initially we see in low latitudes associated with the temperature changes and the water changes, decreases for some cereals. Uh, but in other parts of the world, uh, in the mid to high latitudes, in the short to medium term, there is in fact an increase in some cereal crops. Um, and over time, in the lower latitudes, it's bad for cereals in general. Um, and in the more northern latitudes, um, it's difficult to be more certain, but ultimately there are likely to be decreases in some regions. Coast, again, the consequences in many ways are fairly obvious. Um, there are already additional people at risk of coastal flooding <coughs> each year. And of course, humans like living in coastal regions. If you look at the location of cities, many of the major cities around the world are located on coastlines, which of course are attractive environments. Uh, in the past, they've provided easy transport routes. And so there's an awful lot of people at risk living in coastal cities. And those numbers at risk increase as the sea rises and with the consequences of floods, storms. Um, in terms of health, uh, we see changes in the distribution of disease vectors, and we're already seeing evidence of that. Um, and we see the challenges of uh, heat waves, of floods, of droughts, of disasters in general, of extreme events. Um, and then, ultimately, there are the, the potential for the major singular events, um, the potential, if we allow climate to, the warming to get, go too far, for the loss of major ice sheet sources. None of this is precise prediction. You can't look into the future and know exactly what happens. But the trends are fairly clear. Now, I think that this is a figure which is new to the IPCC report on this time, which really sets out the issue fairly graphically and starkly. So on the abscissa here, uh, we have the cumulative total carbon dioxide emissions, anthropogenic carbon emissions, from um, 1850. And this is measured as gig gigatons of carbon. Um, and uh, this is where we are now, roughly. And from the start of the Industrial Revolution until now, uh, humans have been responsible for about 500 gigatons of carbon emissions into the atmosphere. The plot here is of on the abscissa, uh, the number of tons of gigatons of carbon emitted since 1850. And on the ordinate, we've got the estimate of the temperature anomaly relative to 1861. Um, and you can see the relationship between them. There are quite wide confidence limits, um, but the direction of travel is fairly clear. And what you can see in the different colored uh, scenarios are four of the uh, representative pathways uh, that the uh, IPCC considered. Um, so this one here is the pattern of emissions. And you can see this is now years, and this is annual uh, carbon emissions. This is the one that stands the best chance of keeping the planet within a two degree rise. Um, and that essentially gives us from now another 500 gigatons of carbon, so hence the trillion ton target. Um, and you could view this in a way as, as a, a, a budget of 500 gigatons of carbon. Um, you can see then each of the subsequent scenarios where uh, this one is essentially a business as usual um, uh, carbon emission. And you can see if we carry on in the same way as we have been, then by 2100, uh, the temperature anomaly relative to uh, the late 19th century is somewhere around four and a half degrees centigrade um, with quite wide confidence limits. But nevertheless, um, you can see. And then the uh, yellow line, which is the, an intermediate scenario, uh, would give us a, uh, a, a carbon budget of another um, uh, trillion tons, essentially, and would take us up to about um, uh, somewhere between two and a half and three and a half degrees centigrade of temperature anomaly. 
Um, and I think that's quite a clear way of expressing uh, the potential and what will happen if we carry on. So that's the science. It's gone through the most rigorous meta-analysis. Almost every word of the summary report for policy makers was argued over and discussed. And for anyone that's interested, I thoroughly recommend this. This is the IPCC report on one and a half sides. Uh, it's a masterly document. Um, and I always think that if you are going to be able to communicate in the most effective way, um, then you're better to try and communicate in two sides than in 200. Um, but every variant is available, and if you want to read every single one of the background papers that the IPCC looked at, there you're welcome to do that as well. So there's the, the one-and-a-half-page version, um, which is very nicely written, and then the longer version. Now, I want to turn to the communications challenge. And I think the, the real point I want to make is that we are faced in 2013 with a series of huge policy challenges. And they're difficult policy challenges, and that's why meetings like this are so important, because they offer the opportunity to debate some of those policy challenges. But there has been a tendency, I think, for some people who don't like the idea that there are these policy challenges to say the best way we don't need to think about them is by pretending that the science is either not there or is wrong. And I think that is entirely the wrong approach. What we need to do is start from the basis that the science here is extremely robust. There are some uncertainties in terms of the future, but the direction of travel is extremely clear. And that now we must have a debate about what to do about it. And that, I, as I said right at the beginning, I think is the most difficult part of all. So let's just talk about the communications challenge at the moment. And I'm grateful particularly to the group of Nick Pigeon for some of this work because he's been working very hard on the sort of social science and people's understanding and views about climate over the last few years. So in spite of this clear scientific consensus, and in fact I think the most important feature of the fifth IPCC report is that it contains no surprises. It actually crystallizes the previous reports. Um, but if you look, and the question, the exam question here was, as far as you know, do you personally think that the world's climate is changing? Then in 2005, the yes um, answer was 91%, no 4%, and don't know 5%. In 2010, it had dropped 78%, 2012, 79%, and 2013, 72%. Now, I mean, that's clearly a change in terms of reduction, um, but I can't help observing that any politician who got a 72% majority would think they were doing quite well. Um, so the vast majority of people do uh, think that the world's climate is changing. Um, and when you look at, ask a slightly different question, which is in the, um, the bottom uh, uh, bar chart, then the red is people who are fairly or very concerned, the green is people who are not very or at all concerned, and the blues are the don't know and don't have an opinion. And again, you can see that there has been a diminution in 2013 compared with 2012 in those that are fairly or very concerned. Uh, but it is still at around the high 50%. Now, the explanation for the change isn't formally known, but here are three possible explanations. Um, the first is that it won't have escaped anyone's attention that the economic climate is quite gloomy. Um, there have been some quite loud, uh, sceptical voices in the media. And I think that one of my arguments is that I believe that it is very important that the scientific community speaks up both individually and collectively. Because... Sometimes in the media, you can't necessarily tell. You listen to who's the most articulate uh, voice, uh, not necessarily knowing which one has the enormous weight of scientific evidence behind them. So it's extremely important that scientists communicate. And the third explanation is that, to some extent, there is the potential for a level of climate fatigue. Uh, they've been banging on about this for years, 
and frankly, the weather to me still looks the same. Um, and it's inevitable that there is an element of that. Um, and humans have a very bad habit of confusing correlation with causation. Um, and that's a problem in so many different walks of life, that two events associated with each other in the same time, a, a causal link is therefore placed between them. And that was one of the issues um, with the MMR vaccine, but that's a different talk altogether. Um, my second uh, point is that we have to be better at communicating complex information. And frankly, showing slides like this um, isn't going to help anyone. Um, and I think one of our challenges is uh, not to communicate in impossible jargon. Uh, so the other week I was invited to give a talk at the opening of a, uh, a meeting on negative emissions. Now, you know, I ask you, what's a negative emission? Um, uh, it's sort of really hoovering up greenhouse gases. But we, we have to be clear in our terminology. Um, and scientists do tend to speak to each other in terms of somewhat impenetrable uh, language. So um, some of the uh, graphs of um, carbon emissions are in petagrams. Well, you know, what's a petagram? Who's really got an image of what a petagram is? Um, uh, a gigaton. Even that, I think, isn't a very meaningful term to most people. A billion tons, uh, that's getting better. A thousand million tons, I think people are starting to get a good idea of what that means. Um, express it in sacks of coal. You know, how many times do you fill this lecture theatre? You start getting better imagery. I think we've got to get better. And I think we've got a problem with what I would characterise as the large number problem and the small number problem. And I think people have a difficulty grasping both large numbers and small numbers. So 10 gigatons is very difficult quantity to grasp. And equally, 0.9 degrees centigrade of warming since 1901 doesn't seem like very much. But the point, of course, is that it is not evenly distributed. And it is associated with increased energy in the atmosphere. It is associated with climate disruption. And so I think we've got to think very carefully about the clarity with which we present the information. And that's my point, really, about the, 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 the large numbers and the small numbers. You know, how do we get the idea over of the enormous amount of carbon that's being emitted? And in the case of the, the sea level changes, three millimetres per year doesn't sound like very much. But cumulatively, that's enormously important. So that takes me to the third part of my talk, which is the policy challenge. How do we respond to the risks? And the challenge, of course, is that in spite of all we know, carbon dioxide emissions from human activities continue to rise, and also, of course, the emissions of other greenhouse gases as well. Um, and this is looking since the Industrial Revolution at coal, oil, gas, and cement, which are the major anthropogenic contributions to carbon in the atmosphere. And people sometimes say, well, why can't we wait? But the challenge is that carbon dioxide has a very long half time once it's in the atmosphere. And so these are two different pulses of carbon dioxide modeled into the atmosphere. Um, and you can see that for putting 100 gigatons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, you can see there's a fairly rapid clearance of about half of it over a period of 10 to 20 years. But you can see after that, uh, there's a very long persistence of the remainder. Um, and this is modeling a much, <coughs> excuse me, a much larger pulse of carbon dioxide. So once carbon dioxide is up there, it takes a long time to come down again. Um, the other discussion, of course, is how we divvy this up between nations. And this is one of the biggest and hardest policy challenges of all. So this is a map of the world where the, the size of the country <coughs> excuse me, is, is, is related to the um, proportion of uh, carbon emissions. Um, and you can see on this map that um, the United Kingdom is a wee bit bloated, um, and it accounts probably for somewhere between 1% and 2% of carbon emissions. The color of each of the countries uh, relates to the number of tons of carbon dioxide per capita. Um, and so you can see that although, for example, Australia is small in terms of the uh, total, 
nevertheless, per capita, it's one of the major contributors to carbon emissions. <coughs> and that's because, of course, Australia has a relatively small population for a very large land mass. Um, and you can see the rest of the map yourself. Uh, but the, you can see that although uh, the UK isn't uh, amongst the highest uh, carbon emissions, um, it's still higher than in China and India. Uh, but what about if you take a historical view of uh, our, our contributions? And there you see a rather different picture because, of course, the UK um, is distinguished by having kicked off the Industrial Revolution. And so if you look at our historical emissions, the UK is probably responsible for approximately 6% uh, of the carbon emissions in the atmosphere. Now, I'm not telling you what the policy consequences of that are, but I can tell you that in the international discussions, both of these graphs figure large, or figures. So what are the policy responses? And this is where I think we have to have a completely open discussion where scientists certainly do not have the monopoly of wisdom and where the politicians whom we all elect have the difficult task of working out what to do. Um, but I vividly remember, um, just before I started my job, listening to John Holdren giving a lecture at Imperial College on climate. And he, I think, rightly said, we have basically three choices. Uh, we can mitigate climate change by changing our ways of uh, delivering power um, and by reducing our consumption. We can adapt to the consequences of climate change. And of course, the Thames barrier is an example of an adaptation uh, to the threat of um, uh, surges um, uh, from the channel into the Thames. Or we can suffer. Um, and the reality is, of course, that we're going to have to do all three um, but I think probably most of us would feel that we need to optimize the ratio between these. But uh, there is a point of view that says we shouldn't do anything about it, we just see what happens. That is a grown-up debate, but I really do not believe that the right way to get at this debate is by pretending the science is wrong. So what do the policymakers need to understand? Well, first of all, they need to understand what are the consequences of unmitigated climate change and what, what might one do to mitigate them. Uh, secondly, politicians, of course, need to understand what we, the public, think. Because, of course, we're the people that elect them or don't. Um, and thirdly, they need to see what are the existing and, indeed, what are the new technological opportunities. And looking at the National Risk Register, um, then we can see that as far as the UK is concerned, a number of those key national risks um, are likely to increase um, both in the probability of happening and the impact as a result of the climate changes that are likely to come our way. So um, coastal flooding, and I do apologize, the slides are difficult to read. Um, inland flooding, drought, heat waves, storms and gales are all significant. And in fact, you can see coastal flooding on the National Risk Register um, is one of the highest things on the risk register um, in terms of uh, it, its risk and its impact. Um, so those are for us. But people sometimes say, OK, well, actually, the UK isn't going to be the worst afflicted country. Um, but actually, the impacts of climate on other countries are likely to be very dramatic for us as well. And so I showed you some examples of extreme weather events where human contributions to climate change are likely to have had an impact. And here's another one, which was the record-breaking heat wave and drought in Russia in 2010. That caused wildfires, um, and it caused deaths. And importantly, the grain harvest fell by 30% that year. There were restrictions on grain exports. Um, and this is the um, FAO food price index. The global wheat price, wheat, sorry, the global wheat price rose very rapidly indeed. There were food riots in some parts of the world, including in Egypt. And you can start seeing the possible um, uh, causes and consequences of global disruption from extreme events in one part of the world. 
Um, and so the risks from climate disruption in other parts of the world may be just as significant for the UK as any direct impact on our climate. We are frankly part of a highly interdependent global economic system. Um, our own international uh, investment by UK companies is over a trillion pounds. Um, and equally, the level of incoming investment from overseas companies at the end of 2011 was uh, almost a trillion, well, it was 766 billion pounds. Um, and so climate disruption, extreme events occurring in other parts of the world will impact on UK overseas interests. Um, I think everyone will remember the floods in Thailand that caused problems in the supply of uh, computer chips. Um, we are now part of a truly global and interconnected planet. So I said that policymakers are going to understand, uh, have to understand how we, the public, think. And again, work from uh, the Cardiff Group um, showed, I think, the issues that policymakers are going to have to to face. And I think one of the things I very rapidly appreciated as the government chief scientist is that for any complex issue, you need to look at it through a series of different lenses. And so if we take the lens of energy or the lenses, there are three lenses that politicians and policymakers need to look through. The first is the lens of security of supply. If the electricity supply fails, then life as we know it in a advanced, highly technological society pretty much stops working. The consequences are very extreme. So you can't look at energy without looking through the energy security lens. The second lens is the lens that I've been discussing, which is the lens of sustainability, of sustainability of the planet. The third lens is the lens of cost and price and affordability. And anyone who looks at energy through one of those lenses on its own is unlikely to come up with a coherent or sensible answer. And almost everywhere I look in terms of the policy advice, science is a very, very important part of the advice to politicians, but it's not the only part of the advice. And understanding those lenses, and the interesting thing is that when Nick Pigeon did his work on the policy challenge, then you could see those three lenses coming out from the view of the public. So on the top right, you can see that 74% of respondents are very or fairly concerned about climate change. 79% believe the UK should reduce its use of fossil fuels. And that's a 2013 survey. So a very high recognition that actually climate change is an issue and that we should worry about fossil fuels. Then. 82% in the bottom right of the British public have strong concerns about the UK becoming too dependent on energy from other countries, concerned about having no alternatives in place when fossil fuels run out, and the possibility of a national petrol shortage and frequent power cuts. So there's the security of supply lens. And finally, 83% of respondents fairly or very concerned that in the next 10 to 20 years, electricity and gas will become unaffordable for them. So the public identify the lenses very straightforwardly, and those are the lenses that energy policy has got to be passed through. And these are the sort of values um, around um, uh, energy and the environment. So you can divide them into sort of two broad areas, reducing the use of finite resources, so avoiding waste, being efficient, capturing opportunities, protecting the environment the concept of naturalness and nature. It's very important to understand the values of the public if you want to understand when people are protesting about something. It, it, it may be this very complex set of values that underlie the views. Um, the very strong concept of social justice, of fairness, of honesty, of transparency, of having some kind of long-term view, the long-term trajectory, the thing that everything is interconnected, and a long-term view that we should be living better, improvement and quality. And then, of course, the issues of availability and affordability, of reliability, of safety, and then the real importance to people of autonomy and freedom, of the feeling of choice and control. This is the value set in which people are developing their views about climate. And unless we understand these, 
and are able to respond to them, again, we're not going to have the best debate. Now, decarbonisation, of course, can bring many co-benefits. And the China, of course, is taking climate very, very seriously at the moment. Um, and many of us will have seen the images or indeed been to Beijing and seen the appalling quality of the air. Um, and that is a very powerful driver for action. And so decarbonisation can bring many co-benefits for health. Um, it should be able to improve energy security, reduce pollution, improve health outcomes. You know, in my own area, um, many people around the world still burn fuel, biological fuel essentially, very inefficiently on open hearths. They have terrible lung disease, terrible pollution. They have actually, because they burn in an open environment, they have burns. Efficient stoves are good for the health, they're good for the planet. Um, reduce fossil fuel import deals if we can develop um, our own um, I I energy systems. Reduce risk of energy-related water stress. So there are many co-benefits, um, but we, shouldn't, we should be very clear about what are the real ones. Um, this is a, a slide, this is just a, a, a tool that I commend to you. It's developed by... Uh, David Mackay, who many of you in this audience will know because, of course, he's Regis Professor of um, Engineering in Cambridge, uh, but he's also the Chief Scientist at the Department of Energy and Climate Change. And this, and the, the web address is on the, um, uh, uh, the top of the slide, is a way of analysing pathways to the UK commitment to reduce our carbon emissions by 80% by the year 2050. And what you can see are... Um, uh, these are the various different um, energy sources, and then you can basically adjust um, how we use our transport, um, how we warm our homes. Um, um, uh, so these are all uh, consumption sites. You can view different energy intensive industry. You can then play with uh, different sources of energy, offshore wind, onshore wind, tidal and wave. And by fiddling with these, you can really get an idea yourself of how much of these different activities you need in order to um, uh, achieve those targets. So it's an extremely good um, engagement tool. It's an engagement tool for policymakers. It's an engagement tool for all of us. There, in fact, is a, uh, a version for younger people. And the interesting thing is that this is being picked up worldwide. So there is a Chinese version of the 2050 calculator. Um, for any of you that read Mandarin, it's available on, uh, openly um, on a, a website in China. Um, this tool is being picked up and used by policymakers throughout the world. And indeed, DEC have now started the development of a global uh, 2050 pathway um, analyzer. And this is another way of looking at the challenges. So here are four exemplar scenarios, each of which would meet the UK's legislated emissions reduction targets. Now, these are exemplars. And, of course, there is the opportunity to mix and match between them. There isn't any single right answer. But what they're quite useful for is showing some of the scale of the challenge. Um, and I'm not going to go through these in detail, but I'm just going to sort of pick out a few points just to show some of the technological challenges that they <laughs> offer us. Um, so in all of these scenarios, you have... Um, 33 gigawatts of nuclear, and we have 10 installed at the moment, 16 gigawatts. In this higher nuclear, less efficient strategy, we have 75 gigawatts of nuclear energy. Um, in um, uh, three of them, we've got, or in four, or four of them, we've got carbon capture and storage, varying from capturing from 28 gigawatts or, 34, uh, or 40 gigawatts in this one. Um, we've got different wind uh, strategies. This one would require 82 gigawatts of wind, and I can tell you that's a pretty demanding target. Um, but, of course, it's not only um, the production of electricity. Um, it's also, and, and indeed, the use of gas. Um, and this is looking at uh, buildings and particular heating in this, in this row. Uh, this is looking at transport. So this, these are ultra-low emission vehicles. Um, and in the higher renewables, more efficient scenario... This actually requires shift to 100% of um, ultra-efficient emission vehicles. Um, and uh, so, again, I would encourage you to go and look at these scenarios. They're on the DEC website and have been. But meeting any one of these scenarios presents huge challenges from where we are now. Um, 
So this is what we actually have installed at the moment. So in the case of wind, we have roughly uh, 10 gigawatts of wind. And of course, everyone here knows that wind doesn't blow all the time. Um, and wind blows more offshore than it does onshore. Um, but that's over 5,000 turbines. Uh, if you were to get to um, the high um, uh, renewable scenario, you can see the gap is gigantic. Uh, the, the gap in nuclear related to the high nuclear scenario is from 10 gigawatts, nine plants now, up to more than 70. And of course, in case of the high carbon capture and storage scenario, well, the installed CCS is zero at the moment. Um, so this is actually an opportunity. Of course, it's a challenge. It's a huge challenge. But it is actually a huge technological opportunity. Um, and uh, my predecessor, Sir David King, uh, suggested that we needed another uh, Apollo project or a Manhattan project. Um, and he suggested that it should be in solar energy. Um, I think, and I think um, David Mackay thinks, that we should not put all our money on a single uh, racehorse in this particular race, that we are actually going to need all the technologies that are available to do that. Um, but the challenge is great. Huge projects are required, and they need to be funded. Um, the thing about both the Apollo and the Manhattan project, and I think probably I prefer the Apollo project, um, was that both did have a well-defined signal technolo single technological objective. Um, this is now a planetary objective, and there isn't, I think, a single roadmap. We do actually have to back a number of different technologies, um, and we're dealing with a very complex scenario. So this really is about opportunities as well as challenges. Um, it is, we are a very ingenious uh, species. Uh, we are very innovative. I'm in an innovative city um, in a college that's been here for a very long time, and I was amused by the um, um, wireless um, uh, key, uh, password. Um, and indeed, actually, the lecture theatre reminds me somewhat of a, an 18th century anatomy lecture theatre where I rather feel I ought to be doing a dissection. But, um, but leaving that aside, uh, we are ingenious, and there are huge technological opportunities and there are many people in this room and in this university, and indeed universities around the United Kingdom and around the world, that have the opportunity to play a huge role. And so if we're going to get to, for example, a higher nuclear scenario, um, then we will need new storage solutions for the energy because, of course, uh, nuclear provides base load, essentially. It's not something you easily switch on and off. And so we need better storage systems for energy. It will require new technologies, new fuel cycles, new sites. Um, but the UK is good at this. We're very good at fusion technologies. Um, we could be at the forefront of developing other new technologies in this arena. Um, in renewables, the challenge, of course, is that they do need to be cheaper. And in some senses, we wouldn't be having this discussion at all if there was a renewable or low-carbon source of energy that was much cheaper than fossil fuel. I mean, it would be game over in that point. Um, but there is an economic challenge, and therefore we have to find ways to make renewables technologies cheaper. Um, I've already said that the scale of wind deployment would be a huge uh, challenge. So 82 gigawatts is over 16,000 5 megawatt turbines, um, and wind does not blow all the time. Um, the take-up of electric vehicles is very low at the moment, um, and to increase that, we would need very considerable new supporting infrastructure. Uh, the grid is not able at the moment to support uh, the wholesale adoption of um, electric vehicles. And, of course, it requires us to change our behaviours. Um, and that's um, the social science challenge is at least as tough as the physical engineering challenge. Um, but of course, ultimately, if we are more energy efficient, uh, then we will reduce demand, we'll lower emissions, and we'll lower our fuel bills. And again, thinking of the economy, and politicians quite rightly worry about our economy, then the UK is at the forefront of research in a number of these areas including a work on offshore, on wind turbines, um, and indeed in the science of next generation solar, where indeed Cambridge University, where I am at the moment, or we all are, um, is very good at this science. Um, carbon capture and storage. Um, at full scale, this is not uh, proven so far. Um, and of course, thinking about the large scale use of bioenergy, Again, there are concerns about land use, about sustainability, relating to a high bioenergy scenario as well. 
Um, but of course, if we could become good at carbon capture and storage and sequestering it properly, um, then that would be of global interest because, of course, it would allow fossil fuels to continue as part of our energy mix. And again, if we were able to do this, this would be good for our economy. And of course, we're one of the small number of countries in the world that has got a full-scale test planned. Um, and obviously, the combination of bioenergy with CCS could actually reduce net emissions. Um, but the real point of that is to illustrate that there are many, many technological opportunities. But I end, really, um, with this slightly emotive slide, which says that whichever policy adoptions are adopted, there will be a cost. And I worry somewhat about applying the sort of econ economist discount rate. I think the sort of discount rate question really is what price a grandchild. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed. Now we have got um, half an hour or so for questions, and um, I would be very grateful. We've got a. Oh, there's, next there, there's, the, there's the grandchild. Here. Exactly. <laughs> um, I'm sure a lot of you want to ask questions, so if you could indicate clearly, wait until you get the microphone when I invite you. Please stand and give your name and where you're from so we know uh, who you are. And I've got one here and then one at the back. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, Brian Tipping, journalist. Uh, what are your views on fracking in Britain in this mix? Um, so, so I think my answer is in two parts. I mean, firstly, fracking, is, of course, is about um, uh, methane gas. And methane, uh, because it has conveniently one carbon and four hydrogens, is uh, a better fossil fuel in terms of carbon emissions than coal. Um, but, of course, it's not perfect. And David Mackay wrote a good paper on this for DEC uh, the other day. Um, it is a, a, a drilling like any other drilling. Uh, there was a very good report by the Royal Academy of Engineers and the Royal Society, which was commissioned by my predecessor, John Bennington, um, which provided sound and independent advice and said that as long as, as with any other drilling technology, one looks after the casing, one does it in a very responsible way, it is essentially a safe technology. It's like drilling for oil. Thank you. Now we've got one at the back and then one upstairs. In fact, two upstairs if we can be ready. So one right at the back. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> so Mark, Michael Kelly, thank you very thank much you. for that. Uh, I want to just pose an engineering challenge that most of the people in the world in 2050 are going to be living in megacities. Mm. And if you look at the uh, area needed to power a megacity by renewables, the numbers just don't simply add up. And there'll be a report, I think, from the Academy coming out soon, pointing out that it's really nuclear and CCS, uh, the only practical things on a 40-year time scale to solve the problem associated with megacities. Um, That's 20 million plus people. Yeah, yeah sure. No, what I mean, I mean, firstly, uh, it, it's indisputably correct that uh, people are moving into cities worldwide, that the majority of the population will be living in cities, and of course we're already seeing megacities in some part of the world. But I mean, in a sense, I illustrated the challenges in those different scenarios. And, um, you know, powering a megacity solely by wind is, is unlikely to be a, an effective option. We are going to need a mixture. Thank you. Now, we've got two upstairs and then one down at the front. Uh, thank you. Hello, I'm, I'm Daniel Zeichner. I'm the Labour parliamentary candidate for Cambridge, and I work with the Shadow Energy team, so I welcome the challenges you lay out for the politicians. Two very quick questions. One, um, what's your view on the likelihood of, of any progress on international agreements in, in the near future? Secondly, closer to home, I have many scientists coming to me saying how difficult the financial circumstances are for scientists at the moment. Uh, uh, only the other day I spoke to a postdoc, almost 30, young family on 28K, world leader in his field. It just doesn't work in a high-cost city like this. What are you saying to the government? How do we maintain Cambridge's preeminence if scientists can't afford to live here? Well, dealing with your questions in reverse order, you wouldn't be surprised to, think that, uh, to hear me say that I am obviously a strong advocate for science, te technology and engineering uh, within government. Um, and I think, actually, if you look at the science budgets, uh, they have, through a, an economically very difficult time, uh, been looked after by uh, all of the governments that I've been associated with over the last few years. 
Um, is there more that can be done for science and technology? Of course there is. And I think one of the opportunities is the technological challenges, scientific challenges that are posed by this enormous challenge to humanity. Um, on your question of um, international agreement, well, that is tough, and uh, you are a prospective politician, um, and we will look to you and others to um, uh, sort this out. I mean, there is a process. Um, there has been a measure of agreement. There's pretty strong commitment internationally. Uh, is it going to be easy? No. Are we moving in the right direction? Well, I jolly well hope so. Uh, it, it's, um, this is something that we have to deal with. Thank you very much, and I think we're all conscious of the Copenhagen uh, background there, but uh, let's hope that we do get more action from politicians. Uh, back here. Woody Kahn, Royal Society for Public Health. I really liked your picture of the insect with many lenses, oh, yeah. but there's a joker in the pack, and I remember when the lights went off here, when oil commodity prices shot up exactly yeah. 40 years ago after the Yom Kippur War, because of the decision of about five or six people. Now, food is a commodity, is controlled by a remarkably small number of players. And the last advice that my Uncle William of the Michigan Business School uh, gave to the then president was not to allow the wheat market uh, to be distorted by political factors, by irrational factors. Teresa Marteau is here, and she knows more about gambling with food than I do. But there are gamblers out there who, in quite small numbers, could really distort things like food and energy prices. We've seen it with oil, I remember it vividly. It's happened locally with food prices. How do we stop the gamblers wrecking all the good long-term planning you're talking about? Well, I, I have to say this is not through science, this is through policy. Um, and in a sense, my role and the role of scientists in general is to explain the science and to indeed study uh, do the experiments, do the observations as rigorously as we possibly can. Uh, I fear scientists can't solve all problems, and they can't solve all the problems of human nature. Uh, but I think the more, I think what's within your question, I think, is a recognition that as the planet is more and more connected, as our demands on resources increase, then you can see that critical resource shortages become a major source potentially of instability. Um, and you could see that due to, uh, as it were, the, the, the weather in the, in the context of the floods in Thailand, where suddenly we have these critical dependencies and we need to work on it. Um, there isn't, I think, a single magic bullet in terms of food security, uh, but we need to be aware of food security. And I think one of the challenges is, and it sort of slightly takes me into a different area of my work, I think we in the UK don't really understand that there's a problem with food security because we go into any food shop and we see that the shelves are constantly overflowing with food. And the idea, actually, that there are problems with basic resources, with the basic grains, with wheat, with rice, um, don't get through. I, very, you know, I was talking about the communication difficulty of this. There's a similar communication difficulty over food security because it's very unlikely that people are going to get it here because they see shells brimming with food. Um, so I'm afraid I don't have a simple answer for you because I don't, I think it's a, a, this is not one that the scientists can answer. Thank you. Now, one here, David, and then behind you, and I think one over here. Good, thank you. Uh, David Cleveley, the founding director of the Centre for Science and Policy. I, uh, this point about communication, I think, is, is really quite important and interesting. And I'd like to ask Mark, in your period so far as chief scientific advisor, how do you think ch climate change messages are being received in government? And slightly more generally, what lessons are you drawing as a chief scientist about how to communicate with the policymakers? Um, well, I think what I'm increasingly learning is that clarity is everything. You know, my job is all about communication. The main tool I have is communication and my ability to, as it were, gain an enormous amount of advice from all of you, from the scientific community at large, from chief scientists across government um, and, 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 and the learned academies. So my job is, is, is then to try and distill that and communicate it clearly. Um, and it takes, uh, it's not easy, it takes practice. But I think we've got to be clear. I think we've actually got to be brief. I think I wasn't being entirely frivolous. You know, one of the important documents of the IPCC is the fact that they can actually reduce it into one and a, one and a half sides. If we want politicians to read it, if we want policymakers to read it, 
there's no point in dropping 200 page documents on their desk. In terms of how it's being received in government, I think the science is received um, very effectively by um, the vast majority of our politicians of all stripes, actually. Um, inevitably, you know, politicians are like human beings and some of them have, you know, their own views. Um, but I can tell you the consensus position is that this is very well understood. Um, the, but the difficult bit is the policy bit. You know, it, it's, it's, it, the, the science, as I said at the beginning, is tough. Communication, very important, but the policy bit is not easy. Thank you, and I think the policy challenges, you were very clear on. Now, I've got lots of people, so um, can everybody hear the questions? We don't need... I'm sorry, I'm not okay. No, that's fine. One here, and then one over there, and then we've got two at the back. Thank you. And another one up. Thank you. Hi, uh, Dr. Nazir Min Sabib from Development Studies. Uh, my question is uh, twofold, and they're related. So I'm wondering, what do you think is the role of agrobiotechnology to answer renewable energy, specifically for biofuels and food security? And the second part, which is related with the agrobiotechnologies, uh, validation with the data on human health effects. One of one of which reason, uh, recently there was a huge uh, protest in the World Food Price event. So your uh, thoughts both on the science and the policy aspect would be appreciated. Thank you. Um, if you want to see the effects of technology broadly on food production, then you go to Rothamsted, where there is an experiment that's been running since 1843 uh, in a series of fields, the Broadbalk experiment. And um, the yield there since 1843 has gone up from one ton per hectare to... Uh, nearly nine tons, and that's through the application of science over that period. Um, the potential yield is as much as 20, um, and so science and technology is extremely important, and we must use all of the tools available to us. And sometimes this discussion gets polarized about a discussion about genetically modified uh, organisms. They are part of the solution, um, an important part of the solution, but they're not the only part of the solution. We have to breed better um, varieties by conventional techniques. We have to use macro-assisted selection. There are all sorts of tools we can use. Um, so, I mean, the answer is yes, we do have to use science to improve food yields and, of course, um, use land as sustainable as we can. Around bioenergy, we've also got to be careful that we do the carbon accounting properly um, because um, if, if we grow our bioenergy, um, uh, you know, if we don't use land properly, um, then we could either damage food production uh, in terms of competition for land, or you know, if you chop down one tree to grow another one, well, there is actually a, you're taking out a 50-year mortgage uh, whilst the new one grows. Thank you. Now, one here. There's so many people asking, so I'll try and help you all. But so be brief, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. I'll give you. Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, John Price from the Centre for Low Carbon Futures. Um, I've got a question which is very brief, but it's got two parts. Um, so firstly, my question <laughs> is, they're re they are related. Um, your, your thoughts, please, on uh, the long-term strike prices now being agreed. Sorry, uh, the long-term? Strike prices. Oh, right. Yes, and also perhaps some of your thoughts, perhaps as an option around uh, more modular nuclear. As an um, option. I, I'm not going to comment on strike prices. They're obviously an active of, a subject of active discussion at the moment, um, and uh, they're, not, they're not science in the sort of strict sense. They may be economic science. So I'm not going to comment on those. Um, and uh, the second point was small modular reactors. Um, well, I, again, that is another technology where the UK could play a very important role. It's a technology that would need development. Um, they don't, um, uh, there, there is a lot of technology development to do, but I mean, it is an example of a technology like other technologies where there is great potential. Thank you. Now, I think we have tweets or something. Oh, shall, we, tweet. shall we see what people outside the room? A tweet. Thank you. I suppose at least. <laughs> Thank you. Um, in, in not more than how many characters? 220. Uh, yeah, this is brief. There's, there's been quite a lot of okay. uh, commentary on, on various aspects of this, uh. often picking up, you know, strands and going off. One question that's come up from several people is, uh, is that your talk started off with quite a lot of concentration on extreme events. I'm now paraphrasing questions put by others, not me. Um, and yet the recent IPCC report. Uh, was placed less confidence in the, in, in the prediction of increasing extreme weather events? Um, I mean, my response there is that actually, of course, the report on impact is coming. Um, this is the report on the physical science. But I mean, the, the answer is that um, we are beginning to observe extreme events. 
Thank you. Now, there was one upstairs a while ago. Thank you. And then we'll come right to the front here. Thank you. Uh, hello. Thank you. My name's uh, Samir Doshi. I'm one of the underpaid postdocs here at the university, <laughs> um, uh, which I'm very glad was pointed out. Uh, in your talk, you um, referenced the declining public opinion and support for climate policy since the yeah. last IPCC report. And we can also see that with political opinion for policy support. I'm wondering what, what is the change in terms of the strategy for communications? What lessons have you learned from the previous report? Because a lot of the recommendations that you're giving were recommendations that we also heard six years ago. Um, on communications, the answer is that we have to communicate more. We have to use all of the channels of communication. We have to get better at it. Um, scientists have to get out of there. You know, as postdocs, you have to get out of your lab a bit more um, uh, to communicate. Um, but, but there's another point which I, I often make and I haven't had the chance to so far, which is that this is not... So my, my PhD supervisor, Peter Lachman, who a number of people in this audience will know, used to sort of distinguish questions as to pollable or non pollable And by pollable he meant those you can vote on. At the end of the day, there is actually a correct answer as to whether humans are causing anthropogenic warming of the climate. Um, th this isn't something you could vote on. There is actually a right answer. And so ultimately, you know, it, it, you're entitled to your own opinions, but not your own truths. That's the sort of Moynihan quote. There is actually a right answer here. And I, I, I just think that we have to communicate more effectively. Thank you, a challenge. There now, isn't a right, magic bullet. Right at the front, and then we had two at back left, if, if we could get ready for those. Lots of people asking, I know. Theresa Motte is a psychologist. Uh, yeah. Mark, delighted to see that uh, behaviour change, you've got that on your slide, and we need more behavioural science uh, so that uh, we, can, we can develop that embryonic discipline that's going to be partially key to this major challenge. I wanted to ask you a question, though. You have a unique position, having been the director of the Wellcome Trust, and you remember what I think was a landmark series of the, the, the Lancet in 2009, mm. which Wellcome Park funded, which was exploring the health code benefits yes. of a lot of changes, and you've alluded mm. to some of them already, so thinking about transport, yes. and also thinking about food production and distribution, and can have enormous benefits on health, thinking about non-communicable diseases and diabetes. From the outside, I don't see DH, DEC and Treasury have it making much of that sort of joined up policy. I don't know what it looks like from the inside. Um, one of my key jobs is um, joining up between departments. And actually, we have a subgroup of uh, chief scientists who have an interest in um, energy and climate um, who are working together very effectively. Um, on uh, behaviour change, Teresa, please give us the magic bullet to change our behaviour. So it's definitely a subject that's very worthy of investigation, um, but it's one of the most difficult and, dare I say, potentially intractable areas of science. Um, and so, yes, of course, it would be lovely if we could all find the mechanism uh, to get on bicycles tomorrow to, um, um, to really adopt the, 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 the strategy which would, which would be good for our health and um, would be good for the, 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 the planet as well. And of course, you will remember that the, um, the example I picked to illustrate the health care benefit was one that came out of that Lancet report. So I, I did remember it. There is a huge, huge issue, isn't there, around behaviour change and engaging people. Mm. Now, there were two at the back and one at the back right, and then we'll come to you. So two... Two hands at the back, thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank oh, you. with a baby, welcome. I wanted you to make her point. It's Emily Shopper and Genevieve. Yeah. <laughs> um, I wanted to come back to the communications question. Yeah. Um, compelling communication is a non-trivial activity. It's both, a, in yeah. a sense, a science, uh, an art form in terms of creatively thinking how best to do that communication and a science in terms of measuring what works well or not in different, um, to different yeah. audiences. Who do you think is responsible ought to be responsible for taking on that challenge? Is it down to individual scientists? Is it down to institutions to put more effort in terms of trying to achieve that? Groups of institutions? No, you, you, I, it's I, clearly I, important, but yeah. if you just put it out there without sort of tapping somebody to actually do it, will it get done? Well, I, I mean, I think in a sense we need a concordat, actually, I, it, because it is a collective responsibility. It must be the responsibility of individual scientists. Science isn't finished until it's communicated. Scientists have a sort of slight habit of believing that the, the communication that finishes their science is their academic paper. Um, 
Um, and actually, scientists are quite good at writing learned reviews for each other. Um, I think scientists probably need to be better at writing um, uh, more clearly for a, a public at large. And actually, I think communicating a public at large might improve their scientific communication to each other as well, frankly. So I, I, I think journals need to get better at this. I was, I was interviewed by the editor of Science yesterday, and I discussed what science might do. Um, um, it's something universities must encourage. But I, I think, you know, on the, the sort of the issue of the, the voices that we hear out there, when people write arrant nonsense, then I think it's the job of the scientific community to write rebuttals uh, quickly and effectively. Um, and you. not write those rebuttals in learned journals which aren't going to be read by anyone else. <laughs> Point. Now, one more at the back here, and then we'll go to the back right. Thank you. Hi, my name's Nick Collings. I'm from the engineering department here. Um, a comment first. I recall when I was uh, starting my undergraduate uh, course in engineering at another university. You'll see why I say another university in a moment. Um, the, uh, the prospectus says the function of an engineer is to subjugate nature to man's needs. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, nobody blinked an eyelid. Um, of course, now the mission statement we have here is uh, engineering solving man's biggest challenges, which is uh, mankind, of course, as man has become mankind, which is a bit more PC, I guess, as well. But um, the, um, the, the, the question I really want to ask is, um, you know, uh, f firstly, humility. Most of the problems we've got are because of engineering and science. <laughs> you know, and now, we, of course, we've flipped over and we're going to try and solve them. But um, do you think anything will really happen unless people are persuaded to vote for a lower standard of living? Um, I think, well, it, 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 so the question is, and it, it turns on Teresa's question, actually, which is whether it is a lower standard of living to live in a more sustainable way. And I think that's actually a, a, a different debate. So I think if we simply put it on a, a low to high um, scale, we're probably not having the right debate. It is actually about living in a more sustainable fashion, and actually it's likely that that would be more healthy. In other words, we would frankly all be more healthy if we did eat less and somewhat differently. Um, so, I, I, so I think I sort of slightly reject the question. Um, um, and on engineers, um, engineers are wonderful, but en I think nature will eventually subjugate the engineers, not the other way. <laughs> Let's hope so. <laughs> right, can we have your question? Thank you. Uh, John Pyle, Department of Chemistry. I'm, I'm a climate scientist, but I wanted to talk about this communication problem. Mm. Um, it's not clear to me where the problem exactly is. I think climate scientists have beaten themselves up about uh, discussion with the so-called climate deniers, some of whom will never, ever accept oh, the not. arguments that, that, that we're putting forward. If we look at what happened with the, the ozone layer problem, mm -hmm. that was eventually solved because DuPont said actually we accept the science, we're going to make new compounds. Yeah. And they did that and all the other industry followed. And it seems to me that in exactly the same way here, the real communication is with people running economies and business. That's, I mean, if we don't solve that, then however much science, and you said the science is largely accepted in government um, and so on, if we, if we can't convince the, the, the economic sector, then, you know, then we're lost. Oh, I, think, well, I mean, you know, short answer, I agree. Thank you. Now, we have somebody in the middle here. Sorry, actually, if you go to the right first and then to the middle. Thank you. Adam Smith from Research Fortnight magazine. I'm really interested in this idea of the concordat that you just mentioned uh -huh. um, for scientists to sign up to, to sort of pledge, I guess, to communicate on science. Would you push for a concordat? Um, a concordat is a bit, a bit sometimes like a it's sort of memorandum understanding. It, it's sort of writing something down, but it, it isn't legally binding. And I, you know whether we actually need a piece of paper, or whether actually we just need to talk amongst ourselves and agree that the right way forward is to, is to communicate more. I think that's the answer. Actually, I'm not convinced that chopping down another tree to create a concordat, um, which will I, I, is what's needed. I think we need to have discussions like this, and actually people need to go away and say, yes, I think that's a good idea, I will communicate more, I'll talk to my uh, mates, my colleagues, and, and do it, so. Would the underpaid turns out to be more of a challenge? Um, I, well, I, yeah, that's an interesting question. I, th I think that comes down to the a, a rounded view 
by those, and I was a funder until recently, um, I think funders do take a rounded view on the, the different qualities that are needed in postdocs. And actually, those postdocs that communicate well, I can tell you, do better in science. Because actually, you know, good communication is sort of correlated. If you can communicate your science well, it's likely to specialist audiences, it's likely you're going to be able to do it to general audiences. And so, you know, people who are good at one form of communication are often good at another. And anything that gets scientists writing better, and I would imagine you would endorse that from Research Fortnight, um, has got to be a good thing. So actually, I think communicating well is actually one of the... I, in fact, I, the last time I lectured in this lecture theatre, um, it was to a group of uh, PhD students and postdocs, and it was about careers. And the point I made then is that the qualities that are needed in a, a scientist, an engineer, a technologist, are that you need to be numerate, uh, and you need to be able to um, do the experiments, you need to understand evidence, um, and you need to be a good communicator as well. And you know with those skills, the world is your oyster. So I, I just think communication is an intrinsic skill. And should we perhaps put more effort into teaching people communication? Well, I think we should. And I think that's everything from oral, visual, and verbal presentations. Thank you, very clear. Right, this gentleman here, and then we'll go to the front and then back to the back left, and then I think we'll be beginning to draw to a close. Thank you. <laughs> um, John Todd, one of the underpaid professors here. Oh, the... my heart. <laughs> this is a man who has been funded by the Wellcome Trust to, um, uh, so not quite petter, my... petter pounds, but... Wait to uh... hear the next bit. Uh, so, um, uh, that was a really enjoyable talk, thank you, and a great talk. Um, you were very successful at the Wellcome Trust. You're a man used to success. What's the single um, <laughs> major single barrier thing. that you have, um, or that you think you might have, to your success in this job? Um, that's a very good question. Um, and, and I think the... I don't think it's a barrier, but I think it's a reality. I think it's got to be a recognition of the multiple lenses point, that science is one of the lenses through which politicians look at issues, but they look through other, issue, other lenses as well. And of course, the lens of electability is a very important one, which is why you know, it goes back to the overall question, how are we going to get global governments to do the, the rather difficult things that are needed to really cope with climate change? Well, it's because the electorates tell them to do that. Um, and so I, I just think I have to recognize that it's, there, there are limitations to what science advice and government can achieve. Um, and the, the short answer is that some battles I'll win and some battles I'll lose. Uh, but it was no different at the Wellcome Trust. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Now there was one right at the front here. Thank you. And then the lady at the right. Thank you. Uh, Miles Parker from the Centre of Science and Policy here in Cambridge. I'd like to um, ask you your take on uh, the future of innovation in the context of the comments you were making about the importance of technological innovation as part of the solutions to the climate change problems. And in the further context, there's at least some economists argue that innovation will provide us with all the answers to the problems and just get us out of the hole. While some other economists, I'm thinking Robert Gordon, would argue that the rates of innovation that we've achieved over the last 250 years are unsustainable and really only a, a blip uh, on uh, what's actually a much slower trend in real innovation over the long term. Um, well, I, I suppose I'd answer that in two parts. I mean, first of all, we can't simply wait for innovation because there's a lot we can do now, so that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is actually I think I rather disagree. I mean, if, if I look at what's happened in biological science and biomedical science, the pace of innovation has been quite extraordinary in terms of, you know, one genome costing a billion quid before 2003 and now hundreds a day virtually costing thousand pounds or two um, in, in, in information technology, in engineering. I mean, one of the great privileges of my job is actually going and visiting um, uh, academia, industry, and I just see extraordinary sort of jaw-dropping things almost every day. So I... I, I don't fear for our innovative creativity, um, I, but it does cost money, it does take effort, and you know, part of my job is trying to optimise the policy environment by acting as a link between um, industry, academia and government, and that's actually what I was doing all day today around Cambridge. 
Thank you. Now, I'm going to take just two more. One back left and then the lady here. And I'm very... Oh, I'm going to take one more at the back because I... And then we really must finish. So, uh, brief questions. And uh, thank you. Andy Mayer from BASF. I was wondering if you could comment briefly on the risks of taking too unilateral approach to what is a multilateral problem, by which I mean specifically two areas. One is competitiveness, which... So one area is... Competitiveness, which oh, right. rarely gets mentioned in the affordability issue. And the second is... Can we really deliver UK leadership on a lot of these scientific questions, or should we be trying to show UK leadership in international partnerships, particularly, for example, say in CCS, where we've been saying we'd do it for a decade without much results? Well, well I mean, I, I, again, I'll answer that in two parts. I don't think there's any chance of us being a, the, the, the sole actor in this, because it's quite clear that many countries are taking this very seriously, so I don't think that's... Um, an issue. On the, you know, can we do it all? Well, I mean, the answer is that the UK is extremely good at science, engineering, and technology. Um, and should we uh, bet on one particular winner? No, we ought to support our best engineers, our best technologists, our best scientists, wherever they are, uh, to tackle these problems. And of course, all of these subjects are about tackling important questions. You know, I always say, to, uh, if I was in my previous life, as it were, talking about what makes a good a grant application, it's actually having a good and important research question. Well, there's no shortage of important questions here. Indeed. So one here and then the last one at the back. Thank you. Um, Claire Simpson, the Department of Biochemistry. So we've been talking a lot about, well, you've been talking a lot about the fact that it's important for scientists to communicate with lots of other people and blah, blah, blah. But scientists have a, a lot of stuff to do every day. You know, it's not easy to kind of find the time to do that extra thing. So do you think there should be more funding opportunities available, for instance, from the Wellcome Trust and from Biochemical Society, to actually push scientists into those sort of positions of more influence, like in the media, into policy, into politics, which do seem to be often, maybe this is a stereotype, saturated by maybe arts people rather than, <laughs> you know, <laughs> scientists? I, well, I'm, I'm certainly not going to comment on Wellcome Trust funding, having stepped down as the director. Um, um, but I mean, the answer is it's not about pushing scientists in. Actually, scientists who are good communicators get pulled into this very quickly because actually there aren't, aren't enough doing it. Um, is it something that absolutely every scientist should be doing? Well, some are going to be more gifted at it than others. Although I do think it's not something that's entirely innate. It can be taught. Um, there are funding opportunities. There are increasing funding opportunities for public engagement. There are pairing schemes um, between, I think, the Royal Society, for example, and parliamentarians. There are a lot of opportunities. People need to take them up. Thank you. And our last question from the back. Thank you. From the very back. Hi. Thank you. Um, I wanted you to talk a bit more about seeing this as an opportunity, climate yeah. Uh, change as an opportunity because you put up the slide about the Apollo project and the Manhattan project but those were technological advances that came out of an antagonistic political climate yeah um, and how do you see hopefully a more positive political climate spurring on new innovation um, well, I, I, I suppose that, you know, at, at a flippant level, one can see the world with a cup half full or half empty, um, and I think it's better to look, I'm a half full person. Um, uh, the, it is perfectly true that some of the major science and technological challenges have been dealt with uh, by unpleasant <coughs> crises, in other words, war, and war has been a, a highly undesirable but important driver for technological advance, and we've seen this for a very long time. Um, the question, I think, is whether science, well, sorry, whether society and policymakers view this as a sufficiently important challenge to devote the resources that are really needed to it. Um, I believe it is a significant challenge, and I think we need to devote huge resources to it. Thank you. Well, I wonder if I can ask you to uh, join me in thanking Sir Mark Walcott. I think you gave us a real sense, not only of the science, but also of the communications and policy challenges. And I think the very strong message we'll all have taken away is the sense that there are both opportunities and threats, but also a need to spread 
innovation, technology, um, and indeed to, to give ourselves choices for the future. I think it's been very interesting actually how much of the discussion tonight has been around communication. Yeah. Um, and a, a, a both a, a worry about how uh, communication is possible and perhaps also a little bit about listening skills, but also a sense about how important it is for us to engage with the public in terms that they can understand and the behavioral challenges there. So I think you've left all of us in this room and many people at the cutting edge of many of these arguments, both in research and communication, uh, with a sense that we have to communicate, we have to support the uh, challenges that you've outlined, um, but that we also need our politicians to listen and to be engaged. So thank you very much for lecturing us to us tonight. Thank you all of you for participating. I hope you've enjoyed it, and uh, I'm sure you will be attending more of these seminars for the kind of stimulating intellectual exchange that we've had tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you.